Father, I thank you for your word. Your word is a light and a lamp. Your word is food indeed. God, and I believe that your word has everything to help me with my marriage, to help me with my walk, to help me with my business, to help me with my children, to help me with my struggles. I believe that. And thank you that we can come before your word as so many have for thousands of years and be refreshed and renewed, filled like a giant Holy Spirit gas station. By the power of your word, fill us today, please God. We ask it for your glory so that we don't keep screwing up again and again, God. We want to we want to be holy. Amen. 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 The Epistle of Paul to Titus. Now, an interesting thing happens here. Now, Titus is a, is a, a short little book, just a few chapters. But it was written to a, a son in the faith of Timothy named Titus. Some believe he was uh, Greek, according to Scripture. He was Greek. He was left at the Isle of Crete to continue the work started there in Greece. Just the opposite, though, of Timothy, where Timothy was ministering in a big city, a metropolitan area, Titus is ministering kind of like in the backwoods. And you all know, maybe you don't, maybe I haven't been clear. My wife shared with me last week, man, I've been really coming down on big churches over the last couple of months. And I said, baby, that's just because we've been going through that type of scripture. It's not, <clears throat> I don't have anything against big churches. As a matter of fact, I grew up in a big church. I was saved in a big church. And the church that I grew up in was not good because it was big. It was big because it was good. And that's extremely important to remember. A church that is big is not good because it's big, for there are a lot of big churches that are very bad. But some churches are really large in number and in size <clears throat> because they're good. Because their pastor is faithful to deliver the word. Because the leadership is faithful to go into the mission field and the neighborhoods and share the love of Christ. So if I have made anybody think that we're better because we're smaller than any other church, I'll have you know that we as a congregation are larger than most. I want you to know that. That just because we're in an area that's metropolitan and there's big churches, the vast majority of churches in this country are smaller than we are. And I don't want to, at any point in time, say, oh, we're bigger because we're better because we're smaller. No. Both churches, bigger and smaller, they come with their ups and downs. Amen? Everybody knows that. If you were brought up in a big church, it's kind of impersonal. There's kind of very little accountability. You can come and go and nobody knows your name. and They put people in ministry who don't deserve it. And so forth and so on goes the large church complaints. But little churches... Little backwards churches like the little church here in Crete that Titus was left to be in charge of. Now we know that comes with its little share, doesn't it? Just the opposite. Everybody know your business, don't they? <laughs> Come to church on Sunday, go, hey, how are you? Where were you last week? Thank you, sir. Now on, every time I cough, I'm going to get water. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, bro. You know, in a little church, they don't have the resources to help. You come to the church and you have a major problem. It's like, man, we, we can't pay your mortgage for six months. We'd love to, but we don't have the financial resources. Little churches. We have missionaries who we'd love to send out and keep in the field. There's a couple of you guys here that have the heart to go into the mission field and stay there. And I wish we had... I mean, my home church... When I was going there 10 years ago, they had a million dollar budget to send out missionaries. Man, would I love that. Imagine once somebody doing say, hey, here's a million dollars to your church. And we go, oh, well, praise God, a million dollars. But that's only for your missions. What? 
man, I'm going to send somebody here, and I'm going to send somebody there, and I'm going to send somebody. That would be great, wouldn't it? Little churches come with their little problems, don't they? But here's the thing, and we're going to learn today, starting. <clears throat> Neither a little church or a big church is exempt from following God's Word. And what turns a big church into a bad church, or a little church into a bad church, is not adhering to God's Word. Period. For God's Word addresses all these things, starting today, in the book of Titus, verse 1, Paul writes, Paul, a bondservant of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect, and the acknowledgement of the truth, which accords with godliness. Please give me your attention. Paul is a bondservant. He is a slave to God. A willing slave. He says, I didn't do this to get ahead. I didn't do this to become big. I didn't want to be a big shot. It wasn't like there was a bunch of people hanging out in the church that I wanted to be a part of. I did this because God called me here. And it's been to my suffering. It's been to my misery. It's been to the loss of my family. Paul, as some of you know, was a Pharisee. He was a very well-to-do, some would even say wealthy religious leader. But his faith in Jesus Christ, his belief, his calling, his willingness to put himself in slaveship as a bondservant cost him a lot. Question today biggest part of the message is what has your faith in Jesus cost you? Has it cost you anything? One of the things that scares me about the big churches is the guys are all driving big cars. The vast majority of them that I know. The world looks on and goes, must be nice. And you can say, well Ryan, don't you drive a new truck? Well, yeah, it's about a year old, but I still work a job. Been at the same job for 25 years, as a matter of fact. That affords me the ability to buy a new vehicle every few years if I want one. But I didn't get it from your money. Your money goes back to this church. And I always think about the guys from Compassion. For years, I supported Compassion International. Don't show of hands, but I know a lot of you guys support Compassion International. It was just a few months ago, I got a letter that the guy that's the CEO or something like that is going to be speaking. And a letter was sent out to all the senior pastors in the area. Come and see Ted or whatever his name was speak. He's the head of Compassion International. And you know the good work they do. There's thousands of kids and you get the letter and you get the picture and I love it. I love it. True pictures and letters from kids from all over the world. And I did a little research and found out they pay this guy $300,000 a year. I said, what the heck does a minister need $300,000 a year for? So I called up and I said, listen, no, we're not going to be going. We won't participate in that. And can I ask you a question? Why do you pay him $300,000 a year? And they said, well, you have to understand that currently our organization takes in more than $7 million a year, and that is a very small percentage based upon, and he happens to be the figurehead. And then I found out, Samaritan's Purse, Franklin Graham, well-respected, well-trusted, he makes over a million dollars a year between Samaritan's Purse and his father's ministry. And I thought, man, I just don't get it. It doesn't sound like a sacrifice to me. I did not get into ministry to make money. I did not get into ministry to make friends. Now listen, please understand, Compassion International, Samaritan's Purse, the Billy Graham organization, these guys do a great work. And I am in no way denigrating their service or their work or anything like that. I just... I just have a hard time swallowing that big old bone. $500,000 a year from two different places? 
Well, again, their excuse, their story, their reasoning is they use him as a figurehead. And it's his figurehead alone that causes people to trust, to give, and the percentage is very small. As a matter of fact, they said, I bet that your salary at that church is more in percentage than he's making. They said, I don't make a salary from our church. Wrong! Well, most salaries from most churches. Paul, a bondservant, a slave of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledgement of the truth which accords with godliness. Here, the Apostle Paul is stating something. Not only did his faith in Jesus Christ cost him something in the way maybe of finances, maybe in the way he lives, because like I said, the Apostle Paul was a Pharisee, and according to Jewish writings, Pharisees had to be married. He lost his family. His wife said, if you're going to believe in that Messiah, you're on your own. It also cost him, see it says godliness. Now the problem in little churches, guys, in little areas, I know where, you guys might know we got a little cabin up in the woods in North Georgia. We talk about the little church we go to up there sometimes and folk talk like this and the preacher, he watches around his thing and he gets himself wound up, almost like a top winding himself up. He walks around about five, six times and then he goes, ah! and then he starts screaming the message and it comes out in a fire. And, it, and we love it. We love it. Not for me, but I get wound up enough. And then they have, if you guys haven't, haven't heard the description because it's great, they, they have uh, the seats in back and the elders and, and the, uh, the deacons, they sit in back and, and they encourage them. Come on, God, come on, give it to them. Oh, bless them, Lord. Oh, bless them. <laughs> that's right. Mm. That's like a word. I don't know if that's speaking in tongues for these guys. Because mm. you hear that one. Mm. And every once in a while, a pastor will look back at one of the elders and he looks at me and goes, <laughs> and he's preaching, he turns around looking. <laughs> Problem with them little churches, there ain't enough people to pull from, and you don't know who's godly and who's not. And they've been grounded in there in so many generations, and all of a sudden you look back and you find out that, man, one of your elders is sleeping with one of your deacon's wives. Bro, you better deal with this. Now, that's not happened at this particular church, but this happens in little churches that the leadership is so grounded. It's, 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 it's now, it's not God's church. It's the neighborhood's church. It's this family church. My family been in this church. You know, all of a sudden, you're like, wait a second, wait a second. I saw that guy at Walmart, and, and he was cussing and fussing and flipped me off the bird or whatever it is. You know, and it's like, you got to deal with this stuff. Some churches that are small, one of the problems with the small churches is people's moral compass might have been compromised because their position is a little too safe and secure because nobody can confront them because it's their church. One of the things I like about Calvary Chapel is I have the freedom to run this church the way God leads me to, but I also have a body that can remove me. I have a board I have uh, elders and can say, you know what? You've gone too far, young man. I have that. I have that in place for such a reason as that. That's how Calvary chapels are laid out. You guys know what I'm talking about, anybody? Amen. It just happens like that. And one of the things that Paul said is the truth which accords with godliness. What has Christ done in your life for if what you've done for years and years and years is go to church on Sunday and then you drag your kids in and you drag your kids out and then they drag their kids in and they drag their kids out. But ain't nothing going on in here and ain't nothing different going on out there. He said the evidence of God's word working through faith is a change in life. For it's been many, many times where I said, you don't punch your clock here. You're not punching your time clock. And there it is. I punch my clock, and here I am on Sunday morning. I'm at church, and when I get to heaven, here's my time card. You went to church. Great. It's not the way it works, guys. The Bible says that many are called and few are chosen. 
The Bible says that narrow is the way and hard is the road which leads to everlasting life. And there are few who find it. But wide is the gate and easy is the road that leads to death and destruction. The truth which accords with godliness. Are you fighting the good fight? Now listen, especially for you that might be new to Scripture, that might be new to church. At first it's just, at first the godliness is just a conviction, it's just a knock on the heart. And I know, especially for some of the sisters in here, it's, I don't think we should be doing this anymore. And the guy's like, what are you talking about? I mean, we've been going to church, huh? And, and all of a sudden I feel like this isn't what we should be doing. I know the sisters that go through that. They, they sit in my office and they, and they tell me and my wife, you know, and the boyfriends are, well, it's like we're married. No, it's not like you're married. It's like you're fornicating. If you're feeling the God, that God knock, well, you know, I probably shouldn't be drinking. I shouldn't be smoking that herb anymore. Listen, for some of you new guys, that's all it is. It's just a knock. I know when I came to the Lord, because I was like a brand plucked from the fire, because my life was in such a, an absolute disaster area. I mean, the last person you thought would ever come to the Lord, and all of a sudden, there I was, boom. And there I am in the middle of church, and I'm looking around going, wow. All these people are, are like holy, and they know I'm not. And I walked into church and I felt dirty. And I, I'd be the first one to tell them, listen, I, I go to church, the place burns down. I might just turn into fire as soon as I walk in, you know what I mean? <laughs> I was just going to just ignite as soon as I got a Michael Jackson thing happening, you know what I mean? <laughs> I made light of it and I made a joke of it because every time I went there, the conviction of the Lord was upon me. The Holy Spirit was the only time I gave Him a chance to penetrate my heart. And I was just like, I know things got to change, but it's just so hard out there, man. God understands. You understand how hard it is out there, don't you? Yes, He does. And His mercy is new every day. And His forgiveness is open to all, but... Brothers and sisters, there comes a time. How many years you've been walking with the Lord? How many years you've been coming to church? How many years you've been blowing your witness? How many years you've been struggling in your marriage? How many years you've been smoking that stuff? How many years you get mad and put your hole, hole in the wall? How many years you've been sleeping around? How many years? You see... According to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledgement of the truth which accords with godliness. With godliness. It's not easy. It's a good fight. The Bible says, Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. That mourning is not everybody who's sad. That mourning is you knowing your sad state. The first time that you are fully broken, the first time that you know... <coughs> I've told this story before, and it bears telling again, just in case there might be somebody here that's gone through it. Being a, an athlete, being somebody who is extremely um, disciplined, I found myself overcoming sin by the power of the flesh. If I didn't want to, as an athlete, I'd have to lose weight and gain weight and lose weight and gain weight. So if I wanted to lose weight, I'd lose weight. I'd stop eating. My wife would say, how do you do that? I just don't eat. How do you not eat? Just, I have to lose weight. I just don't eat. And she said, I hate you. <laughs> If I wanted to, I, I had very long hair growing up. I would grow up in the 80s, probably, and me and my wife were together, and I had long hair down here. And one day, it was Christmas, and I decided to buy my wife a, a, a gift. I shaved my head. <laughs> and, I mean, could you, ladies, could you imagine going from hair down to, to shaving your head? Ladies are like, I just, discipline. I found myself... 
struggling as men do as a young eight, seven, eight year old Christian with lust of the eyes. Just women were so beautiful to me. And I just, no, I, I wasn't sleeping around, but I just, oh, I, I hate. And I just couldn't stop looking. And I was like, baby, I'm trying to tell my wife. It's just, <laughs> now you ladies might be thinking what are you just a, an animal yes <laughs> the brothers know exactly what I'm talking about right or wrong yeah now the, the, the married brothers are like don't know what you're talking about <laughs> my brother's back going <laughs> that's a good one <laughs> So here's what I did. I said, okay, I've grinded through everything else. I'm going to grind through this. And every single time a good looking woman would walk by, and I would, I am not. <laughs> Anytime, no matter how she dressed, I, I, I could go to the beach and I'm just going to muscle through it. And I said to myself, if I would overcome this, if I can actually overcome this, I'm going to be so close to God, it's going to be amazing. Everything is going to flourish before me. I just, I couldn't wait for just to get some time. I even read this book. There's this great book called Every Man's Battle. And it, it talked about the psychological and chemical aspects of, of, uh, of, of what lust of the eyes actually did chemically in your brain and how to do it. And, and, and some of the things it said were just amazing. One of the principles in it that actually helped me overcome it to this day was men see in what What's called grids. Men analyze things in a grid. You see something and immediately before you is a grid, like a big tic-tac-toe thing. And your brain, according to your flesh, fills out the grid. You see a woman, guys, boom, what comes up in that grid? Well, she has big this or big that or, or, or round this or whatever it is that is your particular flavor, that your style, whatever it is that you really like, your fleshly mind puts in that grid. That's what she is. But what's not in that grid is what she actually is. She smokes cigarettes. She's had six lovers in the last week. She, you know, I mean, all the things that you dislike about her, you don't put in there. <laughs> She would leave you if, for another guy, you know, she, if she, she would never change her kid's diaper if you got threw up around, you know, all the things that my wife does that I take for granted, I don't put in the grid. All that's in the grid is va va voom. <laughs> and you have to fill in that grid. You have to fill in it reality. Because for guys, the power of this is, it's destruction of your life. Uh, for some ladies too, especially in this day and age, lust of the, of the flesh for, for women is, is worse now than I, I believe it's ever been. With the crossing over of so much acceptance of homosexuality. I mean, nobody's ever going to love a woman like another woman mentally. I mean, woman needs tenderness and kind affection and only another woman could understand a woman like that and that's why you meet a, a, a lesbian woman and she wants to come out life's out it's very very hard because they're very very lonely when they don't have their woman lover there because they understand the heart of a, another woman the sex thing is, 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 is minute it's minuscule that goes away after you know a couple of years but, but emotionally, it's very, very hard for a, a, a lesbian to come out of that lifestyle because they, they truly miss the emotional aspect of that. Anyway, after reading this book and understanding these things, I, by the power of my flesh, focused. And it was about nine months into this, I had this thing 95, 98% beat. And during a time of prayer and fasting, me and a few other brothers prayed and fasted for a week together. We got together and, and spent some time, a couple of hours in prayer. And I said to the guys, I, I, I'm telling you, I've got this thing beat. And in prayer, God gave me this vision where I was climbing this mountain so high and there I was climbing this mountain and, 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 and the mountain was the lust of my eyes, the lust of my flesh. 
the pride of my life. And once I got to the top of the mountain, I was sure, man, God's going to be right there, man. He was going to be right there. I was going to touch the hand of God, and there I was. They were going to anoint me king of Christianity or something like that. I don't know. <laughs> I'd be a pastor then. And back then, I wasn't. I was just a, just a Christian. I wasn't a deacon. I was, I was just another guy going to church who just lo truly loved Jesus. No call in my life. Just, just somebody who loved to be forgiven. I was forgiven, and that was enough for me. No striving. I didn't want to be the next whatever in church. I'm just glad to be forgiven. Nobody ever forgiven me before. So in prayer, I get to the top of that mountain. And in this vision that God gave me, and I don't know if it was a vision, vision, or a thought that God gave me. It's a weird thing. You guys are, are new to hearing the voice of God. When God speaks, He doesn't like, hey, how you doing? My name's Ryan. It's nice to meet you. It's not like that. God takes this little tiny seed, and like He puts it in you, boom, and like the whole conversation is there. Boom. So does anybody, you ever get your kids those little sponges, and they're like this big, you put them in water, and they go, Phew. That's how God talks to you. He takes that little sponge, he puts it in here, and he's like, the whole thing's there. Wow, we just had our conversation. It was like, no time at all. Man, I wish I could do that with my wife. <laughs> just had a whole conversation, you know what I mean? I'm out of words, baby. But it's okay, because I heard everything you said. <laughs> but I got to the top of that mountain, my brothers and my sisters. And you know what I saw? Five other mountains. Bigger stronger that I could not attain in my flesh. Let me tell you what happened at that moment in prayer, that sweet hour of prayer with my brothers. What's called brokenness. I realized, and this is what a lot of us need to come to this realization, you can't do it without God. Without the power of the Holy Spirit, you can't do it. I don't care what background, I don't care what sport, I don't care what I don't care how disciplined you are. You cannot walk this walk without the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. It can't happen. Do you understand that? There I was by the power of the flesh overcoming sin. Thinking as soon as I got there by the power of the flesh how close I'd be to God. And I got to the top of this mountain and I went, yeah! Oh my God. What is that? That's your moodiness. I'm not moody. No, you really are moody. No, my wife's crazy. I'm not moody. No, you're moody. And it has nothing to do with her craziness. God didn't really say that, but I just <laughs> couldn't let her off the hook. And beyond that was my selfishness. And beyond that was my self-righteousness. And, and I was just, I, I'm truly, it's the first time I think that I'd ever really cried from, from just brokenness. It's like, but how could I overcome what I don't even see? How could I, how could I flesh my way through this? How could I... And it was a, my brother Ray, I'll never forget, Ray Traver said, We can't do it without God, Ryan. Like, shut up, what do you know? I just frustrated, broken, and the choice that we get to, my brothers and sisters, Christians in the room, is do you decide from there to fake it? Or do you decide to there to reach out and for the hem of his garment and say, please help me? You, want, you find yourself groping around in the dark, God, please, I need you. More than ever, God, I can't do this without you. What is your faith in Jesus Christ costing you? Might be costing you a good time. Man, sex is a lot of fun. Getting drunk and partying, man, that's a lot of fun. But I got something better now. Much better. That leads to, ready? Next verse. Verse 3. But has in due time manifested his word through preaching, which was committed to me according to the commandment of God our Savior. 
I'm sorry, verse 2. In hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised before time began. In the hope of eternal life. In the hope of eternal life. In the hope of eternal life, which God, who promised and cannot lie, God can't lie, He's promised me eternal life, with the faith that leads to godliness, and here we are. So I guess the choice is sitting here before you. You can smoke, drink, party, have a great old time in the hopes that it doesn't lead you to hell. Or you could follow the power of the Holy Spirit and don't do those things and have the promise of eternal life. Hey, you want to hear something crazy that the world isn't telling you? Want the crazy good news? Here's crazy. You ready? How many of you guys never want to have an abortion? Show of hands. How many guys? Men also. Never. You guys never want to have an abortion? Guess what? <laughs> Don't sleep with somebody. <laughs> huh? Yeah, it's that simple. You don't want to have an abortion? You don't want to have a kid that you didn't plan on, that you can't take care of? You don't want to have a kid? Don't have sex. It's a certainty you won't have a kid. Only happened once. And look at what happened. Hey, how many of you guys never want to wind up in a drug program? Show of hands. Never? Never want to wind up in a drug program? Ne never. Guess what? Don't smoke herb. Don't drink a beer. Oh, come on. Are you going to tell me? I'm going to tell you if you never smoke pot and you never drink beer, you'll never wind up in a drug program. How about that? Man, pot's like legal, man. Alcohol's legal. Oh, well, by all means, partake. And when your life is in the toilet, then say, but it's legal. Well, don't worry. The government will take care of you. They'll pay for your rehab <laughs> by my taxes. Guys, this is not brain surgery. These things want to drag you to hell. Do you understand that? Let's boil it down. Does anybody know what reduction is? Anybody? Cooks, chefs in the room? Reduction? My favorite reduction is balsamic vinegar. Has anybody ever had balsamic vinegar reduction? It's the greatest. It's the greatest thing in the world. It's like take balsamic vinegar to the tenth power. <laughs> And it's gooey and sticky. You can dip your bread. It sticks to the bread. It's like, oh my goodness. We're going to reduce it for you, okay? I'm going to reduce this message that we're preaching today. You ready? God wants to spend eternity in heaven with you. The devil wants to destroy your life and drag you to hell forever. That's the reduction. Ready now? Let's unreduce it. God says, don't break my laws because you can't get to heaven without following my laws. Without the power of the Savior upon you. The devil says, screw your life up. It's good. You can accept him on your deathbed. You could follow Jesus when there's nothing left. Yes, that's it. As we unreduce it, you see how confusing it gets? But the reduction is simple. Don't have sex. You won't have to get an abortion. Because abortion will destroy your life. Aside from the fact that the baby you just killed. You don't want to wind up in a drug rehab facility? You don't want to cook your brain? We had a couple of... We had a kid that came to church on Wednesday. He'd been coming here since he's this big. I love him and I love his family. And this kid at 17 or 18 years old has completely fried his brain. He is not even close to the same. He's done. You understand? He's done. Listen to me. My young brothers and sisters... This kid is done. His life is over. You all that were here on Wednesday, you've seen him, you know who I'm talking about. Yeah. 
he was just like you guys, sitting in the front row, and he was happy, and, and Austin would take him out to the concert, remember? And he was a part of our youth group, and he'd go out door to door, and he'd smoke himself a little herb, drink himself a little thing, listen to a little rap music, and all of a sudden this white kid turned black. <laughs> Okay, your parents don't talk like that, and that's really weird. You're, you're, you're freaking me out, buddy. <laughs> and he's fried his brain. He is not ever coming back. Do you understand that? <laughs> Click. <laughs> Click. The beer doesn't say on it, one more and you're hooked. One more and your life's over. Now you will forever be classified as the alcoholic in the family. But you can avoid all that stuff, my young brothers. I think I made that message clear. Any questions? <laughs> Turn, please, leaving here, and we shan't be coming back, to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I want you to see what it is to be a preacher for a minute. Again, the Apostle Paul, writing to Titus, one of the sons of his faith, who's at this little church in Crete. 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. He says, the message preached, we just read in Titus, through preaching preaching. What I'm doing here is preaching. I'm preaching a message. I'm preaching a message that you don't need me to preach. You grow, you learn, you get godly through a preached message. To me, it's foolishness. Why should I have to preach? Anthony, you okay? You with me, buddy? Yeah. Stay with me. My wife always says to me, lock it, Pocket. What does it say? Is that how it goes? <laughs> You've heard that before, have you? The preaching. You guys can read this yourself. I mean, this is, you understand what, what the world doesn't understand, what the world doesn't get? You gotta come here listen to me for. Please understand this, and this is so much a part of the message that, that Paul was trying to explain to Titus, that God's trying to explain to us. Do you understand that we each have our calling? My calling is no greater than any of yours. I have not reached the pinnacle of success because I preach God's Word. This is the calling. This is the personality that God gave me. This is the gifts God gave me. Each one of you guys have gifts. All these folks are up here, including my young brothers and sisters. They have a gift of boldness, and they're going to go out and they're going to share the faith. <coughs> I'm not more important. I'm not some... It's, it doesn't work like that. Look at what he says here, starting in verse 18 of chapter 1 of 1 Corinthians. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. Do you understand... It's like, if you look at any of the stuff from The Master's Way on YouTube, and you see Ray Comfort, one of the best apologists of our time. I mean, the guy's phenomenal. Quick-witted, intelligent, small, ultra-smart. You see the comments of the foul, vitriolic wickedness that people will say about him, and you're like... You misunderstand completely what he said. You don't understand anything that the guy is saying. You miss the whole point. They don't get it. They are what the Bible calls spiritually discerned. Spiritually discerned. They don't get the message because the preaching of the word is foolishness. Why did you come over there to go see some guy who drives a brand new car, who lives in a gigantic house, who... It's not supposed to be like that. We're supposed to be level ground. One of the reasons we have the pulpit here and not up here is because when I was preaching up here, it felt just a little weird. I don't like being so... You look up to me, it makes you... Don't do that. Don't do that to me, I'm not going to do that to myself. It's very easy to become a megalomaniac when so many people come and see you. And the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. 
but to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. Yes, here's my blessing. I get to be filled with the power of God for about two hours a week. Wednesday and Sunday for about an hour at a shot. Ask my wife, other than that, it's a waste. And I get to pour out upon you what God's Word is speaking through me. I am not some ultra-anointed. You come to my house and, and you see me, I might scratch my arm. Ugh, wow, he scratches his arm. No, an angel comes and scratches when I have an itch. <laughs> my yard is a mess. My kids are unruly. Yeah, I'm just like you. <clears throat> but the preaching is our power. I'm receiving power. You're receiving power. If you believe. If you want to receive. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Verse 20. Listen to what he says here. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God. It pleased God through the foolishness of the message priest preached to save those who believe. Please, let me explain to you because of the intelligent way that the guy who wrote this, Paul, also speaks, which was way beyond me until I read it about 8,000 times. The world thinks it's stupid for us to believe in what we can't see. They don't understand anything about our faith. Why in the world would we go them for smarts, intelligence? He said, listen, where is the wise? One of the wisest guys that ever lived was a guy named Voltaire. You guys might have heard this story already. Big French artist. He was so smart. So he said, Christianity will be gone in 100 years and nobody will ever know who the Bible was and blah, 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 blah. Voltaire's house now in France prints Bibles. Christianity is still here 2,000 years later. God's Word is still here 5,000 years later. Guess what? <laughs> you guys don't even know who Voltaire is. <laughs> Neither did I. Who? Voltaire? So you guys discovered electricity? <laughs> I know who Jesus is. He's the name that's on everybody's mouth. He's the name that's on everybody's heart. You'll hear the world use it as a curse. You'll hear my wife use it as a blessing. When they hurt themselves, when they are stunned and surprised, who do they call upon? Jesus, Jesus Christ! Why did you just call that name for? It's just something idiots like me say. Why? You just hit your finger with a hammer. Jesus! It ain't Buddha! Voltaire! Every movie, every TV show, seldom can you go a day without hearing the name of Jesus a hundred times. You know why? Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom didn't even know Him. They're so smart, they don't even know God. But it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. The foolishness of the message preached. Yes, here's the foolishness. I'm the fool, here's the foolish message, you believe in it, and now you become a fool too. A fool for Christ. Believing what you can't see with your eyes, and yet having power to defeat the world. Kingdoms rise and kingdoms fall 
But the word of our God goes on and on and on and on. You figure of anything, a book written, completed 2,000 years ago, completed 2,000, written some 5,000, some of this is written four or 5,000 years ago. You'd think that alone would be enough for some people to go, listen, the book's lasted that long, there's got to be something to it. Because there ain't no other books written that long ago. Anybody read anything from um, Socrates lately? He's a great writer. I mean, no, how many of you guys? No? no? But we preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block and to the Greeks foolishness. But to those who are called both Jews and Greeks. Now, what, what does this have to do with the message today? Where did I go? How did I wind up in Crete? Listen to me. It is the message. It doesn't matter whether your church is large or small. It doesn't matter if there's thousands of people, hundreds of people, or tens of people. The Word of God is what dictates our business here. This is what we're doing here. Following the Word of God. And nobody is void of it. If you have a hassle with somebody in your church, follow Matthew 15, okay, go 18, go to them one-on-one. -on -one. We don't do that at our church. What do you do? Well... I went to my elder and he told me to talk to a deacon and a deacon called a meeting and the meeting said, wait a second, you completely broke scripture. You don't understand how things work when you have this many people here. You don't But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For you see your calling, brethren, not many wise according to the flesh. <laughs> Wait a second. What? Doesn't he know I'm an athlete? Yeah, how far did you go, Ryan? Uh, I almost played pro ball. <laughs> Why didn't he call Babe Ruth? Why didn't he call Michael Jordan? Why didn't he call... Because if these guys got saved, they could really make a change for God in the world, right? Uh-uh. God chose the foolish things. You see, all you all that call yourselves Christians, wasn't a compliment. <laughs> no, no, no. It was an honor. Don't get me wrong. It's an honor. But it ain't a compliment. Foolish. Weak. That's who you are. Foolish and weak. Sneezing and everything. <laughs> not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God has chosen the foolish things of this world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of this world to put to shame the things which are mighty. And the base things of this world and the things which are despised, God has chosen that the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence, but of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God, and righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption. That is, as it is written, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. Not in the power of his flesh. You can't stand on a hill and go, I made it to God. No, you can't. You can stand on a hill and say, I reached out for the hand of God. He touched me and he pulled me up. That's what you can do. Praise God. Glory to God. Or as Chuck Smith would say, isn't God good? <laughs> you guys that have listened to Chuck Smith, you know. All right, I'm done. You guys got the point. So the next couple of weeks, we're going to beat up little churches like we beat up big churches and do our best to stick to the Word of God as best we can and ask God to change our lives and ask God to help us walk a little bit better out there. And if you got questions or you want to start your relationship with the Lord, we'll have a team up here, men and women, in our leadership team to help you with that. Because it ain't never too late. Never. As long as your heart's beaten, God's calling you. Amen? Let's pray. God, we thank you for the blessing of your word. We thank you, God, that your word has got such wisdom. Your word has got such power. I thank you, God, that through the foolishness of the preaching of the word, my life has been transformed and changed, God. 
God, I allow and willingly call myself a weak fool because I want to be strong and wise in you. God, I want you to use my brothers and sisters that are here for whatever you decide. I ask you, God, please, by the power of your Holy Spirit, by the strength of your word, God, to change families, broken families that need to be made whole. I ask you to do that, God. I ask you by the power of your word, by the strength of your Holy Spirit, to help men and women that are struggling with, with lust and greed of all kinds, God. I ask you to give them a little more strength this week, that they would touch the holiness and the godliness and find the pure joy. Not just a joy that comes from sin, but the joy of the Lord, which could be their strength. God, I pray for anybody that's in here that is financially hurting. Show them, God, that you're not short on cash. And you have the power to save and to raise up in your hands. Lord, I pray for anybody here that is in need. Just from a healing touch. They're broken hearted, God, and they need you to heal them. God, I pray, heal them. God, I thank you so much that we can call upon you for anything. And your spirit, as your word says, your mercies are new every day. Thank you, God. We love you. These things we pray in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys.